Good morning, can you hear me? Oh, there we go. All right, good to see you all this morning. Glad to be able to join together in worship and I want to invite all the folks that are worshiping online to uh, register their attendance with us so that we can know that you are worshiping with us today. It is a joy to be able to come together and to worship in this place uh, this morning. I want to draw your attention to a few announcements that we have. Our blessing of the animals service is going to take place tonight at 5.30 here at the church, just right here outside uh, the gathering behind in the grassy area. And so you can come and bring your pets on leashes and we can offer a blessing. We're looking forward to that time uh, together. We are going to ha- take up uh, items to donate to the McMain Humane Society, McMain Regional Humane Society. And so we're looking forward to that tonight. Adult Fellowship will meet Monday, October the 18th at 6 o'clock in Innsminger Hall. So all adults are invited to come to that. We're continuing our Wednesday night study uh, on the Reverend Will Shelton's book, Roots of Eden. I'm going to be leading that in Innsminger Hall. Pastor Dave's study on the life of King David is going to take a break this week because of fall break. And so he's off being able to enjoy some some rest and relaxation with his family. Uh, But we are going to start cantata practice this Wednesday at 7.15 for anyone who's interested in singing in the choir for the cantata during Advent. So love for you to come and be a part of that as well. You're also invited to our fall festival, which is Wednesday, October the 27th from 5.30 to 7. We've got trunk or treat and games, and we need some volunteers to help uh, offer a trunk, or you can come and and volunteer your time to help out with the youth or help out um, lead some of the games and help out direct traffic, all sorts of things that you can do. Um, You can also donate candy, and you can bring that by the church office. So a number of ways that you can get involved in that. Also, United Methodist Women's Sunday is next Sunday, October the 17th, not the 10th. Um, We're going to have a 9 o'clock service in the sanctuary and an 11 o'clock combined service down in the sanctuary as well. So we won't won't be up here next week. We'll be down in the sanctuary. We're going to have Rhonda Paulson from Isaiah 117 House coming as our guest speaker. So I'm looking forward to that presentation. Um, At this time, let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we go to the Lord in prayer. Loving God, we come to you in our worship this day as we join in praise and adoration. As we celebrate and remember the story of David dancing before the Lord, help us to be open and vulnerable in our own worship today. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. You'll stand with us as you're able. Nothing works. 
Amen. I want to thank my wife, Allie, and her childhood best friend, Kinsley Melhorn, uh, for singing that song. I want to let you know that, that I worked with them all week and uh, really trained them up so that they could uh, do this song, and I think they did it justice this morning, so thank y'all. I'm... <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, at this time, I'll invite Marcus Gwen to come forward, and Gail, I didn't check with you before, but okay, okay. So, Gail, you are joining, but you're joining virtually, I believe. Is that, is that correct? Okay, so um, we're glad to have Marcus and Gail both joining our church uh, this morning. And so, Marcus, I've got a certificate, and I've got Gail's if you want to go ahead and take both of those. But really, we just have uh, two questions to ask you. Marcus actually was a member of this church before when you were a teenager and then moved away a couple years ago. And um, so... Uh, but we really just have two questions to ask you. Um, the first is, as a member of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? And then the second question we have is, as a member of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Amen. And... Uh, Tyler, I think we might have some slides. Okay, so I'd like to invite um, you to respond uh, the, the slide after this one. Members of the household of God, I commend this person to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase his faith, confirm his hope, and perfect him in love. I invite you to respond. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. 
that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. So welcome, uh, Marcus and Gail, officially as members of our church. And so thank you so much. You can, you can have a seat. Absolutely, yeah. And I hope after the service you'll get an opportunity to officially welcome both of them. They've, they're, they've been members of this church for a long time, but now they're just making it official. And so if this is something that you have thought about, what it might look like for you to join the church, I'd love to talk with you more after the service about what that might look like. But this time we have come to our, uh, our prayer time. And again, it is a joy to have both Marcus and Gail joining us um, it's also a joy to have Ellen Peach, who is a retired United Methodist minister, preaching down in the sanctuary. She offered a wonderful sermon at the 9 o'clock service and um, is preaching as we speak down at the 11 o'clock service. But it's a joy to, to have her and I might you maybe uh, sometime during this week to go back and watch the live stream of her sermon. She just did a wonderful job. It's also a joy this past week, Ellen and I went to the Art Center's production of Beauty and the Beast, and I, all the... Uh, cast were wearing masks, but even through those masks, you could see the energy and the excitement, and they were just did a wonderful job, but especially want to brag on the Borwick family, members of our church. Um, they just really stole the show and did a, did a wonderful job, so always glad to have um, ways to lift them up. It's also a joy to announce that we have hired a new custodian, Mikael Medeiros, and so he is going to start here in a couple weeks. Randy Berger is retiring, so we're sad to see him go, but I'm glad that he's able to spend more time with his his wife. I know he's looking forward to that. Do we have any other joys that we would lift up this morning? Any joys or celebrations? Well, in our bulletin on the back, you can see a list of folks that we want to continue to lift up throughout the week. Um, I certainly want to lift up the family of Leanne Daniel. This is a young uh, woman who lost her life in a car wreck, um, I believe, yesterday. And her, her mother is in uh, critical care, ICU, um, recovering. And uh, so we just want to pray for their family during this time. That's a, a very sad loss. So we, we lift them up during this time. Uh, we also want to lift up the family of Susan Morrow. Uh, this is Scott Miller's sister who passed away this past week um, from COVID. And so I know that they're mourning her loss as well. Um, also want to lift up the family of Joyce Wong who passed away yesterday. Um, this is Jeanette Amos's really good friend and has been on our prayer list um, before. And we also want to lift up Anna Underdown, who had two strokes and is recovering from, um, from that at UT Hospital. So a number of, of very serious uh, things going on within our congregation and within our community. Um, are there others that we want to lift up this morning, other concerns? The family of Jesse Brady. Yes, thank you. Um, she lost her life this week as well to COVID. C.H.? Michael Paisley lost his life this morning, you said. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll lift up his, his family during this, this difficult time. I know our hearts are, are heavy this morning. Do any of us have unspoken requests which we would acknowledge by the lifting of our hands today? As always, you can let us know how we can lift you up in prayer. You can email us at prayer at .org. You can come and talk to me after the, the service this morning and let me know what's on your heart. You can also fill out the response card in your bulletin. There's a number of ways, but we're always happy to know how we can come alongside you in your joys and in your concerns. So at this time, let us now go to the Lord in prayer. Beloved God, we come to you this morning and we take a minute to stop and to reflect on our lives. We think about the times in which we have followed your commandments and trusted in your love, and we, we also think of times when we have fallen short of living the life that you have called us to live. Forgive us, O oh God, for when we fail to do the things that you have called us to do. Forgive us, O oh God, for when we fail to be the people that you have called us to be. We thank you for the gift of forgiveness, and we celebrate all the great things that are going on in our lives and in the life of this church. But this morning we also know that there are a number of people who are dealing with situations of pain and loss. 
We ask for prayers from this congregation as we reach out in love and compassion. We pray for those who are struggling with sickness. Pray for those who are dealing with grief. Pray for those who are in need, dealing with difficult situations, whatever those situations may be. We place these concerns on our hearts into your care, knowing that you can bring forth comfort and peace. And remind us again of your loving presence. Place your hands of healing on our lives and comfort us when we become afraid, lost, lonely. Prepare us to serve you faithfully all of our days. Be with us now in this time and in this place and in all places and times of our lives. For we ask these things in Jesus' name who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We do have baskets in the back and baskets up here in the front. You're invited to come and bring your offering. And when you do, you can also light a candle and kneel and pray. So let's continue our worship this morning.
Well, the scripture that I'm about to read this morning is one of the more difficult texts that I've ever preached on in my seven years as a pastor. In this scripture, we see some horrible things happen to people who don't really deserve it. And I spent all week kind of wrestling with this story. I've studied the Bible, I've looked at commentaries, I've read different books, but kind of any way you slice it, this is a very difficult passage to swallow. Over the past few weeks, we've been looking at the life of King David in this series called Beloved. And this morning, we're looking at some of the terrible events that occurred when David brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Our scripture, we're just looking at pieces of it, and I'll fill in the blanks. Uh, it comes from 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 3 through 8, and then 12 through 19. They loaded God's chest onto a new cart and carried it from Abinadab's house, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, Abinadab's sons, were driving the new cart. Uzzah was behind God's chest while Ahio was walking in front of it. Meanwhile, David and the entire house of Israel celebrated in the Lord's presence with all their strength, with songs, zithers, harps, tambourines, rattles, and cymbals. When they approached Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah reached out to God's chest and grabbed it because the oxen had stumbled. The Lord became angry at Uzzah and God struck him there because of his mistake. And he died there next to God's chest. Then David got angry because the Lord's anger lashed out against Uzzah and that place is called Perez Uzzah today. King David was told, the Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's family. And everything he has is because of God's chest being there. So David went and brought God's chest up from Obed-Edom's house to David's city with celebration. Whenever those bearing the chest advanced six steps, David sacrificed an ark, an ox and fatling calf. David dressed in linen priestly vest, danced with all his strength before the Lord. This is how David and the entire house of Israel brought up the Lord's chest with Shouts and trumpet blasts. And the Lord's chest entered David's city. Saul's daughter, Michal, was watching from a window. She saw King David jumping and dancing before the Lord, and she lost all respect for him. The Lord's chest was brought in and put in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. Then David offered entirely burned offerings in the Lord's presence in addition to well-being sacrifices. When David finished offering the entirely burned offerings and the well-being sacrifices, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of heavenly forces. He distributed food among all the people of Israel to the whole crowd, male and female, each receiving a loaf of bread, a date cake, and a raisin cake. Then all the people went back to their homes. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Here we see that David has conquered Jerusalem, defeated the Philistines, and has officially become the king of Israel. And one of the first things that David wants to do is bring the Ark of the Covenant, God's chest, from Bala to Jerusalem. And the Ark of the Covenant is the most sacred relic of the Israelite people. It contains the two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. It contains Aaron's rod, his staff. It also contains a pot of manna, the bread of heaven. And so having the ark moved to Jerusalem, by doing this, David is trying to honor God's law and commands. So David is really trying to do a very noble thing here. So David has his men, a whole army of people, place an ark, the Ark of the Covenant, on a brand new ox cart. And they begin their journey. They're transporting this ark. And while they're doing that, David isn't there. He's off in Jerusalem, and he's celebrating with the Israelites, with, with the Lord's presence, with songs and harps and cymbals. And while David is off 
celebrating, we're told that two men, Uzzah and Ohio, are transporting the Ark of the Covenant. They're kind of put in charge. And Ohio's standing in front of the Ark, Uzzah's standing next to the Ark. And at one point during this journey, one of the oxen stumbles, the Ark starts to tip, and Uzzah instinctively reaches his hand out to stabilize the Ark, and when he does, he touches the Ark, and God strikes him dead right then and there. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that story, I'm reminded of Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Anybody else think of that story, that movie? Well, if you have never seen that movie, I would encourage you to go watch it. But um, it's, it's a movie that's set in the year 1936. And Indiana Jones, who's played by Harrison Ford, is informed by some government officials that the Nazis are in search of the lost Ark of the Covenant. And they're trying to find this Ark in order to use it as a weapon. And so Indiana and his companions go out in search of the Ark to try to find it before the Nazis get it. And so there's back and forth, they're fighting throughout the entire movie, but, but toward the end of the movie, Indiana and the Nazis, they've all been fighting and they eventually all find their way to the Well of Souls. And that's where the Ark of the Covenant is. And the Nazis open the Ark, and when they do that, God's wrath fills the space in this awe-inspiring, face-melting encounter. God's power is so strong that, that everyone there is killed, except for Indiana Jones and Miriam, because they're closing their eyes sort of in reverence for God's power. And you know, at, at first glance in, in this story, we, we, we see that destructive glimpse of the story of Uzzah. We, we can't help but think of Indiana Jones, but there's a story that takes place in 1 Samuel when the Philistines have the Ark of the Covenant and they're all kind of gawking at it and they're trying to look inside of it. And as punishment, God strikes thousands of people dead. So you get the sense that the Ark of the Covenant is this powerful, strong, holy relic not to be trifled with. It's a powerful thing. It contains God's presence. We see throughout Scripture how God's presence it is, is dangerous. Moses wishes to look on God, and God says, you can't do that, you'll die. We, we see how God's, God's presence, when it's unleashed, is, is powerful and dangerous. But, but I can't help but feel bad for Uzzah. You know, it, it's, his death is incredibly hard to swallow. God seems mean-spirited and spiteful and vindictive in this story. God seems harsh for punishing him in this way. In fact, the humorist and writer Mark Twain talks very honestly about God's punishment. He says, in the Old Testament, God is always punishing. Punishing innocent children, punishing unoffending populations, even descending to wreak bloody vengeance upon harmless calves and lambs. If God had a motto, it would have read, let no innocent person escape. And you know, Mark Twain kind of has a point <laughs> when we're looking at this story. We can't help but feel bad for Uzzah. And I, I think, really, we can place the blame not on Uzzah and not really on God, but I think the blame has to go on David. In the process of, of moving the Ark of the Covenant, King David makes a disastrous mistake. David's mistake has to do with his decision with, with how to transport the Ark of the Covenant. His mistake was that he allowed his men to place the Ark of the Covenant on an ox cart. Now, you might be thinking, what's the big deal, right? Who cares if they put the Ark of the Covenant on an ox cart? I mean, why wouldn't you put the Ark on an ox cart? It's going to be easier to transport that way. A cart has wheels. You've got ox that can, that can pull it just kind of makes logical sense. The only problem is the law of Moses carefully spells out every little detail about how the Ark of the Covenant should be transported. According to Exodus 25 and Numbers 4, the Ark should only be transported, listen to this, by using poles that go through the rings of the Ark, and the poles have to be carried on the shoulders of the priests. God had, had specifically spelled out exactly how things should be done, but David doesn't pay any attention to this. He, fa he fails to follow the Lord's instructions and 
Uzzah ends up paying the price. Now, I can't help but see the irony here because you got David who's bringing in the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, and the Ark of the Covenant contains God's commandments, God's laws. But while transporting God's law, David completely disregards God's law. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's ironic that, that David would do this. And, and God established all these laws in order to protect God's people, to direct God's people. God told them exactly how to transport the ark in the safest way possible. So is this really God's fault? He gave you fair warning. Or is it the fault of humans not obeying God's commandments? Honestly, either way, the story leaves a bad taste in our mouths. Uzzah had good intentions. I think he was only doing what, what any of us would do in that situation. You know, when, when an ox cart stumbles, you put your hand out to steady it. I think any of us would do that if we were in his shoes. But it leaves us wondering, does the punishment really fit the crime? What's interesting is that when David hears about Uzzah's death, though, David feels two emotions. First, he's angry. He's angry at God for killing Uzzah, but he's also afraid. He feels these two very deep, very negative, very real emotions toward God. And you know, we, we get the sense that perhaps David is also wondering if the punishment really does fit the crime here. We get the sense that perhaps David also thinks that the death of Uzzah is unfair and unjust. So David gets angry at God, and he also is fearful of God at the same time. David experiences these very deep negative emotions toward God, and I think that's part of why David is known as a man after God's own heart because David is willing to have a real relationship with God. He's willing to be angry at God. He's willing to be afraid of God. He's willing to go there in his relationship with God. He's willing to experience real human emotions as he connects with God. You know, despite these negative emotions, David doesn't run away from God. However, he is scared enough to park the ark for a while, to, to leave it in the nearby home of Obed-Edom's house. And he's just going to leave it there for a while and not deal with it because he's afraid. He doesn't want any more casualties because of this. But then he sees all these blessings occur for Obed-Edom and his household. And, and all the good things happen, we're told, because of the Ark of the Covenant being there. So, so David says, okay, let's, let's give it another shot. Let's, let's try to get this thing to Jerusalem. This time he doesn't use an ox, ox cart. He gets the priests, and they put the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders, and every six steps, David offers sacrifices of ox and a calf, and he puts on a, a priestly linen cloth called an ephod, and he dances before the Lord in all of his might. David opens himself up to this extravagant worship. It's completely authentic. It's unrestrained. It's vulnerable. David is dancing almost naked, but he is completely oblivious to everyone else around him. He doesn't care what other people think. He doesn't care what other people say. He doesn't care if people think he's, he's foolish. David's sole purpose in this moment is to worship God and not care what other people think. Now, this is not the way that we typically worship, is it? You know, we're good little United Methodists. We, we don't get up and dance, do we? We don't put on a priestly linen cloth and dance before the Lord in all of our might. We don't typically use our bodies very much in worship, do we? I mean, we sit and we listen to a sermon, which I'm thankful for y'all sitting and listening. Don't get me wrong. I don't want y'all to start getting up and dancing. But we, but, but we sit and we listen to a sermon, we stand and we sing songs, but we don't really use our bodies very much in worship. We reflect, we pray. All of our worship really happens here and here. But David gives us this example of what it looks like to, to have totally bodily worship. David worships God with everything that he is, his body, mind, and soul. 
As Eugene Peterson says, David establishes worship at the center reality of existence in general and human life in particular. Worship is our real work. Nothing we do is more basic. So what would it look like for us to enter more fully in worship? Not just here in the gathering, but but out in your daily lives. What would it look like for you to embrace authentic worship? What would it look like in in your life to open yourself up to to these emotions of anger in your relationship with God? To, To have real emotions, real feelings. What would it look like for you to prioritize and focus on worship instead of worrying what everybody else thinks? What everybody else is doing. Now here's the the thing. Not everybody approves of David's worship. Michal, David's wife, is is watching from the window and she sees David dancing before the ark and and she sees him just completely putting himself out there, not caring what other people think. And we're told that Michal kind of criticizes David for, for these actions. She says, How did Israel's king honor himself today? By exposing himself in plain view of the female servants of his subjects like any indecent person would. She's not very happy with David. And David basically responds by saying, I was worshiping God. I was worshiping God. It wasn't for you, it wasn't for the female servants, it was for the Lord, and I will become even more undignified than this. I will become even more vile than this. I'm going to continue my worship of the Lord. So David doesn't apologize for his authentic worship. He's not ashamed or embarrassed or afraid, but his criticism ends up being a very heartbreaking thing for Michal. And and this is one of the things that I struggled with the most as I was looking at this sermon this week. At the very end of this chapter, we're told that Michal had no children to the day she died. I think the saddest part of this story is the treatment of Michal from David. Most people, most scholars, believe that Michal doesn't become barren because of punishment from the Lord. Okay, So it's not because the Lord punished Michal, but instead she becomes barren because David chooses to ignore her and dismiss her. In 1 Samuel 18.20, it says that Michal loved David, David. That's a really big thing. Because this is the only place in the entire Bible where we see a woman love a man. Where a woman's love for a man is recorded. Every other time, we see a man choosing the woman. We don't see if she loves him back. We just see if the man wants the woman. But in this instance, Michal loves David. And what's so sad is that there's no biblical record of David ever loving McCall back. In fact, we we really only see David treat McCall as a political tool because she's Saul's daughter. And let's be honest, David does not have a very good track record when it comes to his treatment of women, especially in the story of Bathsheba, which we will look at in a few weeks. In fact, at this point, David already has numerous wives. So really, I would argue that Michal isn't criticizing David for his worship, but I think she's criticizing David for his infidelity and for his lust and for his treatment of women. The truth is, I have a hard time with passages like this. I have a hard time with what happened to Michal and Uzzah. Um, I, I don't think that it's fair that they're punished so harshly. Meanwhile, David is is often celebrated, even though he commits, I think, even worse, far more terrible sins against others. And if you think about it, Uzzah and Michal are really casualties of David's bad behavior. His failure to obey the law, his treatment of women. But you know, here's the thing. The things I hate most about David's story are also the things that make David's story so real. The things that happen in David's story are sometimes a reflection of what happens in real life. 
sometimes bad things happen to innocent people. Sometimes bad things happen to people who don't deserve it. Sometimes the world's unfair. Sometimes people we love and trust hurt us in a very deep and real way. David's story is a story of brokenness. It's a story that reflects what it actually looks like to live a life as a human being in this world. There are some awful things that David and others do in the Bible, but guess what? There's some awful things that we and others do in our lives as well. And yet, God can still redeem us. And yet, we can still enter into a real relationship with God. And yet, we can dance before the Lord in our worship. And yet, no matter the mistakes we have made, we can still be a people after God's own heart. Thanks be to God that in our brokenness, in our sinfulness, in our humanness, we can be redeemed. Let us pray. Beloved God, we come before you in our brokenness. We come to you knowing that sometimes we make mistakes that harm ourselves, that harm others, and that harm our relationship with you. Help us to be faithful in our relationships and to follow your commands. We thank you that you are a God that allows us to express all of our emotions, both positive, but also those negative emotions that we feel. The anger, the frustration, and the grief. But Lord, we're thankful that you're a God that can forgive us of our shortcomings and bring about redemption even when we don't deserve it. Help us to be generous, kind, and forgiving of one another. May we walk in your ways, delight in your law, and celebrate your love this day. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.
Thank you again for joining us in this service of worship. I thank y'all for sticking with me through a, a difficult text, maybe. Um, look forward to, to next week with UMW Sunday. Again, we do have baskets if you'd like to give an offering. But this time, I invite you to re- receive this benediction. Arise and go in peace. May God's love be with you and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen.